Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. This is Edward Hopper and the American Experience. Thanks so much for joining us. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Robert Kellerman. I'm joining you from the Lone Star State, in Dallas, Texas. And let's see a little bit about me. I was a art history major in college at the University of Michigan. I spent the first two years of my career working at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And after that, I, let's see, went off to corporate America, lived in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. before coming to Dallas. And my favorite American artist, not counting Edward Hopper, I'll go with Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, that's my story, but also have the assistance tonight once again of our co-host, Patty. Hi, Patty. You want to say hello and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, Hopper is one of my favorite of um, Robert's programs because he does draw out a lot of reaction and involvement from the viewers. So I really enjoy that part. And uh, we're batting a thousand tonight, Robert, because O'Keefe is the next most popular one to uh, <laughs> offer. So that would be my choice as well. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, that sounds good. Well, excellent. Thanks, Patty. Thanks for being here. And thanks for everyone else. And again, happy Sunday. So again, this program is called Edward Hopper and the American Experience, as opposed to just being Edward Hopper. Um, so what exactly does that mean, American Experience? That's actually a term I used when I was an art history major. So let's talk about that. So one of the interesting things about America is it means different things to different people, depending on whether you're here in the United States or somewhere else, and even within our country, um, America means a lot of different types of things. But in this context, we're really talking about artists and the unique history and culture of the United States and how the two of those interact with one another. So for instance, uh, when you're talking about the American experience, you really have artists kind of documenting and recording what's going on in history. Hoppers living during the Great Depression, um, the women's rights movement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you see him documenting that in some of his artwork, but then at the same time, you have artists influencing and changing popular culture. Um, Hopper was such an iconic figure in painting. Um, his work kind of influenced a lot of different aspects, particularly like cinematography and stuff like that. So keep on the lookout for that. And initially we had this program a few weeks ago because on July 22nd, it was Edward Hopper's 140th birthday party. Um, and so this was the initial program that we did. And then I think, I can't remember if this is the third time or the fourth time we've done this one. Um, but people kept asking if we could repeat it. Um, we didn't record the earlier version, so I thought I would do that for this time. So initially our program was to celebrate Edward Hopper's 140th birthday. So a little bit belated celebration for him. If you haven't had your piece of cake yet, uh, make sure you take care of that the next few days. And Edward Hopper, of course, is most known for his famous painting, The Night Hawks, which is at the Art Institute of Chicago. We're going to obviously be talking about The Night Hawks, um, but we'll also be talking about a lot of other noteworthy paintings that Hopper did during his career. He was an American realist. And so here are a few more examples of his work. And the fact that he was a American realist during the era that he was working in um, is really quite extraordinary because he was really kind of going against the grain of what was happening in much of the art world. Here are a few more examples of his work. So we'll see a lot of his paintings tonight and talk about a few of them to various degrees. But the 20th century in art is really a time of Abstraction is really the dominant theme, whether it's Pablo Picasso or Claude Monet or Jackson Pollock or Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, abstraction really is the dominant theme of the 20th century in art. And so with Hopper uh, kind of going against that and continuing to depict realistic type images of America, um, he's really kind of uh, going off on his own, so to speak, in a little bit different direction. So another kind of thing to keep in mind. And <laughs> this is what I was talking about before, where artists really kind of shape uh, popular culture. So this is Norman Rockwell, somewhat of a contemporary of Hopper's. And in this image, he's actually making fun of the fact that people are kind of trying to um, process uh, this abstraction that's taking place in the art world. So this is Rockwell's famous painting, The Connoisseur, 
from 1961. Um, just to FYI, this program has a little bit of nudity at the end. I always like to point that out. because Sometimes people have children watching these programs, which is cool. Um, to get kids familiar with art is great. Um, I don't think it'll be an issue. I mean, it's just stuff that you would see in a museum. Um, but there's a few paintings, and they're all towards the end of the program. They do have a little bit of nudity, um, FYI, if that's an issue for you. And then another thing that we do um, that's a lot of fun is we'll stop the program periodically and ask people what they think about the artwork and what they see when they look at it. So I selected these two paintings to stop and talk about. So we'll, I'll go through and discuss Hopper's life and his career and his artwork. Um, some of the paintings we'll talk about at length, some we'll just kind of briefly look at. But when we get to these two, um, Patty and I will stop and kind of see, you know, what do you see when you look at these? Or what do you think about these works? And it's been really um, fascinating since we started doing these uh, types of uh, arrangements, so to speak, one thing that's really noteworthy is the um, the perceptions from the audience really varies a lot from program to program, and the the discussion kind of goes in different directions depending on um, who's joining us that particular day or evening. So that's cool. So be on the lookout for that. So this painting is maybe I don't know a quarter of the way through the program, and then this one is kind of towards the end of the program. So you can be on the lookout for those. So as you're looking at the other Hopper artwork, um, you can kind of see maybe how it fits in with these two works that we'll be discussing in kind of like a group format a little bit later. All right, let's talk about Edward Hopper. Before we really get into like the paintings and stuff um, that he created, let's talk about his kind of uh, biography, so to speak, the early years of his life. Here is Hopper's father, Garrett. He was born in 1852. He passed away in 1913. So unfortunately, he did not get to see his son's success as an artist. And then this is Edward Hopper's wife, or sorry, not his wife, his mother, Elizabeth. And she lived a long life. She did get to see um, quite a bit of his success. She passed away in 1935. Hopper actually did this portrait of his mother around 1915 or 1916. Hopper also had a sister, uh, just as an FYI. If you want to learn more about Edward Hopper, um, there's a few different places that you can go visit. Uh, most of them, the key ones, are centered around New York. And reason being is because that's where Hopper was born and raised. So you can go to New York and visit the Edward Hopper House Museum. And here it is. So this is the home that he grew up in. Edward Hopper House is the birthplace and family home of artist Edward Hopper and now operates as a museum presenting early Edward Hopper work and memorabilia, as well as a, the work of contemporary artists. Um, so there you have it. And just to give you kind of a sense of where this is at. So here is New York City, Manhattan. Here's the Whitney Museum tip of Manhattan. Um, and then if you go north, here's where his home was. And so a great site to visit if you're in the New York City area. And what does it look like inside? Just very quickly, um, a few images just to get a sense. So here's the home. Birthplace and boyhood home of the eminent realist paper painter Edward Hopper. See that I'll let you read that his forebears came from Holland, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Graduated from the local high school, and then this is his bedroom upstairs. You can see here's a self-portrait, and the most noteworthy feature of his bedroom is the light. Look at this spectacular set of windows that he has, and so people have kind of commented on this, like, "Gee, what impact did him living?" in this home as a uh, child and a teenager and stuff like that and all the light that came in uh, from these windows it, how did that impact his career because light plays an important part of many artists production including Edward Hopper and you can kind of perhaps picture him um, sitting here this is an easel so perhaps there's a painting here canvas and you can kind of maybe picture him uh, painting as he looks out the different windows 
if he was forced to um, live in the basement while he was growing up, who knows how that might have turned out differently. <laughs> Maybe he wouldn't have even become an artist. Who knows? And then let's talk about the Whitney Museum in New York City. Here's the Hudson River. Here's downtown New York City. And then here's the Whitney Museum. This is the High Line, elevated walkway. And then here's the Whitney Museum here, this modern building. And the reason why I wanted to point that out is that's another place that you should go if you want to learn more about Edward Hopper. They have the world's largest collection of his work. They have 74 prints, 223 paintings, and over 2,800 drawings. So over 3,100 works in total. Um, the Hoppers made arrangements to donate um, his personal collection to the Whitney after he passed away. So that's why they have such an extensive collection of his work. The world's largest collection of Edward Hopper's work is at the Whitney. So uh, you can go visit his house and then you can go to the Whitney uh, and then I have another spot for you. And he decides at an early age that he wants to be an artist. Here is a drawing that he did at the age of 13 of some sailboats. And I kind of remember doodling a little bit when I was younger, I'm not an artist, <laughs> but of course uh, my doodlings look nothing like this and maybe yours didn't either. But again, 13 years old, painting sailboats. He ended up after high school receiving a formal art education in New York City. He attended a place called the New York School of Art and Design. It's, and he was there from 1900 to 1906. So he was studying um, for quite a few years. He was doing some other things while he was studying there. Um, the school is now called the Parsons School of Design. It's a really well-known art school. Uh, a lot of very important artists and figures over time um, have gone to school there. This is actually Hopper here in the front. He was very tall. And then here's the model. And so this is a class where they're sitting in. Um, and they're doing a nude figure study of a male. And the teachers of this school, William Merritt Chase um, was the founder of the school and Robert Henry was also an important figure in the school. They're not unknown art artists, but they're not uh, necessarily household names. Here is William Merritt Chase. And again, kind of you have to wonder what impact the influence of these artists had on Hopper. Um, so here's some examples of William Merritt Chase's work. He's a very talented American artist and also very talented Robert Henry. And here's some examples of his work. This is Mrs. Whitney, the woman that founded the Whitney Museum, FYI. And so again, Hopper at the Parsons School of Design, which was then called the New York School of Art Design from 1900 to 1906. So he had a very formal artistic training and gets kind of all the basics and things like that, even though he had been um, doing artwork his own. While he's there, he does quite a few self-portraits. Here are three examples of those. This is gonna give you a sense of what he looked like as a young man. These are at the Whitney. So self-portrait from 1903, he's 21 years old. Here's one from a little bit later. And a little bit later. These paintings look very, very different than his later work. They're very dark, they're very traditional. Um, they're nicely done, technically. Um, they're not as, say, dynamic um, or visually intriguing um, as his later work. But you know, that being said, he's just getting started um, in his career. So you can definitely see some talent there. All right, so how does Hopper support himself? Well, before his career takes off as a painter, uh, which would happen many, many years later, he spends his early career working as an illustrator. And what do I mean by that? Particularly a commercial illustrator. So this is an era when they had photography and they had magazines and stuff like that. But if you wanted to put an image in a publication like a magazine, um, it was a lot easier and less expensive to do it with an illustration, if you can imagine that, um, just because photography wasn't as advanced as it is now. 
And so there were a lot of commercial illustrators, particularly in places like New York City. So Hopper works in this field from 1906 to 1925. These are the types of, I'll give you some examples of the works he's doing. So this is actually an advertisement for a men's shirt uh, company. Um, so he does that. Um, he becomes pretty talented in this regard, and he gets a, a little amount of notoriety within the industry. These are actually um, illustrations that he did for um, short stories that appeared in publications. And then some of his work um, actually ended up being on the covers of magazines. This was an advertisement or a publicity poster he did during World War I. Um, so that was something that got him some credit. And then here's some other work. So, you know, Hopper did these works. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of interesting because these don't really look like anything that he did later, in my opinion. You might have a different opinion. But if you go back and look at this illustrative work, so again, very talented, um, but very different. So he, to be honest with you, though, one reason why um, it might not look like his later works, he actually it was not crazy about this kind of work. Um, it was very rigid and structured. He was given an assignment and was very specific on how it was supposed to be completed. So there's not a lot of creativity that he could use. Um, and so he's having, having to go within the guardrails, so to speak. And so that's one reason why these don't necessarily look like his later works, because he's not kind of doing his own thing, so to speak. And then in 1906, he takes his first trip to Paris. He would actually make three trips, I think, over to Europe for um, several weeks at a time. He basically take time off work um, and go over there and kind of check things out. So here's some works from those endeavors. And again, these to me don't really look a lot like his later works, but you have to remember, um, you know, paintings like the Nighthawks and some of his more well-known works, those were done in the 1930s and 1940s. So that's going to be quite a ways in the future anyway. Here's a couple drinking in Paris. And, you know, at this point in time, he's still relatively young. He's only 24, 25 years old. And then when he finally kind of returns back to the United States and um, stays put there, he ends up renting a studio in Greenwich Village. And it's actually open to the public. You can actually go see this normally. It's currently still closed because of COVID. Um, but prior to COVID, you could actually go and visit here. And so just really fascinating to see his studio. Now, you might be wondering, God, how could he afford a studio in Greenwich Village? Well, it was a lot less expensive back then um, than it is now, not just because of inflation, but because um, it just wasn't... Uh, you know, the sky high rent like they have now. So even though he wasn't bringing in a lot of money, um, he was able to afford this type of studio setup. And here's a map of New York City. Here's the Empire State Building. And then here's Greenwich Village and his studio. So another tourist place you should probably go check out. Although, like I said, you have to wait because they haven't opened it back up because of COVID. The building that it's in is actually run by New York University, um, the School of Social Work. I'll skip the plaque and kind of basically explain um, the different things there. Here's the plaque that I just showed you a minute ago. And then here's the building. So, hey, that's a pretty cool setup. And then you go inside and it kind of looks like what you'd expect Hopper Studio <laughs> to maybe look like if you know much about him. Um, this is an excerpt from a profile of the studio that was from Architectural Digest. When Edward Hopper was 31 years old in 1913, he moved into the small Greenwich Village space where he would both work and live until his death at age 84 with a skylight providing the rich natural light he adored and both a roof and a window looking out onto Washington Square Park, the setting was ideal for both his work and that of his wife, the painter Joe Hopper, who worked alongside of him. And there's a picture of Hopper in his studio. It's very plain and Spartan. It's not um, elaborate. You, know, you might think of like an artist studio and I mean, all kinds of creative, crazy stuff going on, but that's really um, not the case there. He made this easel himself wooden piece here um, and actually had this little press 
And he, periodically he would actually spend the night here. He didn't live here per se, but if it was late at night or the weather was bad or something, he'd crash out here as a fireplace. Uh, and then again, he built this easel himself. So how this works is you put the canvas on this horizontal bar. So the canvas would be like up here. And then this horizontal bar, you can slide it up and down. So if you wanted to, you, know, you could put it all the way at the bottom and or you could put it all the way at the top, depends on what you want to do, but he built that himself. And then here's another excerpt from the Architectural Digest profile. It's easy to feel you are seeing the space much as Hopper did. If the area feels Spartan, that's much in keeping with the way Hopper lived and worked. It's not like he was a beatnik and having all of his buddies over. He was very introverted, a very private person. So yeah, Hopper's a big introvert. Um, he's pr pretty much his wife, Joe, was his best friend. Um, he did have, you know, he's a friendly enough guy and had associates and stuff like that. Um, but he was a little on the introverted side. And then again, another view of the studio. So again, check that out. Here's the skylight in the back. And then let's look at some works that he did around this time. So this is the Queensboro Bridge from 1913. Oh, Norma, <laughs> Norma has an interesting comment um, about the studio. She says, oh, I'll post it in the chat for you. Norma says you can get the impression of order and organization look at his studio so yeah that's very observant thanks Norma. appreciate that um this is called evening blue from 1914 so again just kind of giving you a sense of some of the early works that he did before we proceed on to the more well-known ones here's a self-portrait and so again he does the commercial illustration work for a number of years really kind of um, fine-tuning his skills and at this point in time when he does his self-portrait he's really kind of on the verge of um bigger and better things, so to speak. Now, when you talk about Hopper, you can divide his works into like these um, subject matters or themes. Um, and so that's what I try to do here. So there's the window scenes, there's architecture, um, there's New York City life, there's seascapes in Cape Cod, um, there's travel and travelers. And there's one I decided to call love or not, uh, and then the nudes that he did. So sometimes he would have more than one of these themes or subjects in the same painting. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but again, you can kind of group a lot of his works into these kind of categories. And so we're going to go through these categories and look at them. The window scenes, architecture, New York City, life, etc. They're mostly in chronological order, not exactly, but kind of makes looking at them a little bit easier that way. So let's talk about the window scenes, as they're called. And this is one of Hopper's most well-known um, subject matters. It's basically, or essentially, um, we're looking at someone through a window and watch them doing something. Uh, more often than not, they're, the people that we're looking at are females. Um, they could be day or night. And here are four examples. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but the actor Steve Martin, if you remember him, he's actually a big art connoisseur. And I was reading an interview that he was doing where he really likes Edward Hopper. And he said, his subjects increasingly became uncommutative figures, often alone in empty rooms. He translated their small dramas into something timeless and universal in images of stillness and solitude that suggest but never describe a narrative. So I really like this um, comment from Martin where he talks about Hopper is suggesting, but never describing a narrative. And if you go back and look at these works, yeah, you can kind of get a hint of what's going on in some of these, but you don't necessarily know the whole story. Well, if you do know the whole story, it's, be, it's because you filled it in yourself um, as opposed to Hopper giving it to you. So that's a quote from Steve Martin I like. And so let's take a look at some of these quote unquote window scenes. So this is one of the first ones he did. This is called Girl at a Sewing Machine from 1921. If you haven't been in one of our art programs before, what I usually try and do is give you the name of the museum where the artwork's located at. Perhaps you can go visit in person uh, the name of the artist and the years they were alive, the name of the artwork, 
and then of course the year that it was created. So this is a very early window scene, so to speak, from 1921, girl to sewing machine. Not all of the window scenes you're outside looking in. Quite a few of them here are, um, but they, he does have some where you might actually be inside the space. Here's another one. This is at the Whitney Museum. It's called New York Interior. This is also from around 1921. And this is kind of like a classic hopper window scene. Um, so there's this woman here. It's late at night um, because the room is all lit up. It looks dark outside. He actually put these dark vertical lines here to kind of frame the view. Um, if you notice that is interesting. Um, this also here, the clock says the time is around midnight and it's kind of sparsely furnished. And there's this woman here and we're not quite sure what she's doing. She's sewing. Um, it's hard to see, but you can tell that she's actually sewing by the position of her arm and stuff. And so she's sewing her dress. But so we can get quite a bit of information about the work from looking at it, but we don't know all the details. Like for instance, why is she sewing her dress? Did she just come home from a night out and something happened to it? Or is she staying up late because maybe she's going out the next night? Or is she working a part-time job? I mean, who really knows? Um, so that's kind of the, the uh, story, so to speak, with Hopper. He'll give you some hints as what's going on, but not complete the picture. He leaves it up to you to do that. This one's called Apartment Houses, also from 1921. Hearing in woman working. Here's another one, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Night Windows, 1928, so a few years later. And you can see by this time, um, you know, he's a little bit more of a mature guy. Uh, he's 46 years old uh, when he makes this painting. Hopper would typically take the um, elevated railway to get into work or to get into his studio. And so if you've ever done something like that, you're passing by all these windows. And so he'd be able to kind of peek inside. So a lot of people think that that was um, his inspiration or, you know, kind of his, his aha moment, so to speak, when he thought of the idea uh, to make these window scenes. But here's like another example. Um, so we can tell this is at night. Uh, we can peer inside the window. We can tell it's summer because there's a, uh, window open and the curtain blowing out. And here's a woman in a slip and she's bending over. Um, so we are able to get kind of some basics of the story, but what's going on beyond that? We don't know. Is, um, is she by herself? Is she just coming home for the evening? Is she getting ready to go out? Um, you know, what is she doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so kind of a common theme with Hopper's work. Here's another one. This is called Room in Brooklyn from 1932. Is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Usually the interiors of Hopper's paintings are very sparsely furnished. Remember back to the, um, the uh, studio that we talked about um, and Norma's comment that you can, uh, the impression of order and organization uh, in his works is very noteworthy. And then here's another one. This is Cape Cod Morning, 1950. It's at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. And then here's another one. This is at the Walker Art Center, in Minneapolis, Morning Sun from 1952. So this is quite a bit later. So remember he started the window scenes in 1921. So 30 years later, um, he's still kind of uh, exploring this subject, so to speak. And then here's another one, office in a small city. Most of the figures, I shouldn't say most, the majority of the figures um, are female, but periodically he would include a male figure like he did in this case. You got a guy looking out the window. This also really uh, parallels what's going on in the working world at this point in time. If you look at this painting, 1953, 
this is a few years after World War II. A lot more people are starting to work in offices and Hopper is capturing that. Again, his, his work is almost oftentimes um, journalistic uh, in terms of capturing what's taking place in America. So in 1953, a lot more people uh, would have been working in offices than would have been doing so, say, 20 years earlier. And so these window scenes, uh, you can kind of lump them together because they're all very similar, but yet they're all at the same time very, very different. I mean, yeah, these two are kind of similar in that we're looking at a young woman uh, through a window at night, but we saw quite a bit of diversity uh, within the subject matter of these window scenes, different kinds of settings and people and times of day and uh, locations. So, you know, this is in the big city. Uh, this is obviously out in the country because you got the trees here. Um, so again, just they're all kind of similar, but yet they're all a little bit different. So interesting in that regard. Those the window scenes. All right, so Hopper was really fascinated by architecture, and you see architecture play a starring role in a number of his works, and even the works that it's not playing a starring role. Uh, it's oftentimes playing a supporting role. Uh, but let's look at the ones where the architecture is really kind of paramount um, to the work, so to speak. And here's three examples. Uh, the artist Red Grooms had a really interesting quote on Hopper that I liked a lot. Um, he said, in the sense of a white wine, he, being Hopper, certainly was a dry white wine. He wasn't fruity in any way. It's very sparse. He didn't do more than he had to. So that was a great quote from Red Grooms saying he was a dry white wine, Edward Hopper was. And so here's Haskell's house from 1924. So you'll notice in these works, um, usually there's no people or very few people and the architecture uh, really dominates the story, so to speak. This is New York pavements, 1924, 1925. This is at the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Virginia, which is not far from where I used to live. And uh, that's a really fabulous museum, your chance to visit that area. Norfolk's right next to Virginia Beach. We had a little bit of an interesting discussion um, last time about this painting, uh, because you have a nun here, a woman dressed as a nun, um, pushing a baby stroller. Why would a nun be pushing a baby stroller? Did she have a baby or is she maybe working for an orphanage or something like that? But notice here how the architecture, the building, uh, is really the starring role, so to speak. Um, and the two figures are much more of like supporting roles. And also interesting perspective that he kind of cropped her out as opposed to say extending uh, the painting down a little bit further so we can see more of what's going on. This is at the Museum of Modern Art, House by the Railroad from 1925. This is one of his most famous works. And you may recognize it because legend has it, it was the inspiration for a famous home that was depicted in a movie. You recognize the house on the right. Yes, it was Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. So like I said, legend has it that um, Hopper uh, influenced Hitchcock's choice of house that was used in Psycho. And so uh, Hopper's work really oftentimes does have kind of like a cinematic quality to it. Um, and a lot of film directors over the years have said that they were really inspired by his artwork. Um, so that's pretty cool. So perhaps your favorite film director drew inspiration from Hopper. And here's, so again, there's no people here. Uh, we can see the evidence of people because there's a home that was obviously built by people and there's a railroad that was also obviously built by people, but there's no actual people themselves. And then I always like to maybe include a few paintings that you might not have seen before. Um, so this is Apartment Houses East River from 1930. It's not one of his well-known works, um, but again, just kind of different. The fact that he's um, taking the time to study these architectural structures that he's encountering. This is called Sunday, this is the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. 
This was done in 1926. This one uh, has kind of a depression era uh, look to it, but it was done before the depression. So the Great Depression started in 1929. This is done in 1926 in the Roaring Twenties, but it does not necessarily look roaring per se. And the buildings really look kind of uh, grim. Uh, the guy sitting on the sidewalk by himself. And then here's another interesting one. This is called Drugstore from 1927. This is the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And notice x lax making an appearance. And here's the Whitney Museum, early Sunday morning. This is also one of his most well-known works, 1930. We do a separate program on the Whitney Museum. And at that time, we kind of talk about some of the technical aspects. Um, interesting that these windows are all the same shape, but yet notice each one is displayed a little bit differently. There's no two that are the same as far as the shade. Uh, and stuff goes. So that's an interesting feature for that one. And then you have the barber pole here and the fire hydrant. And again, where's all the people at? I don't know. Their gas from 1940. This one does have a figure in it, but he's not the star of the show, so to speak. And for our friends in Dallas, might recognize the mobile oil red flying Pegasus sign. That's a prominent landmark in Dallas. The Delaware Art Museum, summertime from 1943. Actually, let me go back. Um, so Hopper is living in the United States, of course. Um, and what's going on in 1943? Well, the heart of World War II is taking place. We don't really get a sense of that um, all that much in this painting, if at all. Um, you just have a woman's coming out and she's standing here on the steps of this building looking off into the sun. Perhaps she's um, contemplating the future or getting ready to go out somewhere. Maybe she's waiting for her GI husband or boyfriend to come home. Who knows? Um, but again, this is interesting that he's not really um, drawing many references to the war that would have been uh, the dominant thing on people's minds in 1943. 7 a.m. And so architecture. So as I show you these themes and subjects and things like that, um, moving forward, if you go to a museum and see some Hopper artwork, or if you're looking at a magazine or something like that, you should kind of be on the lookout for these, um, like the architecture and like the window views and stuff like that. All right, let's talk about New York City life. So Hopper, born and raised outside of New York City, uh, his studio is there, and a number of his well-known works feature this subject matter or theme. So let's talk about these. We're actually going to discuss this painting here in a little bit more detail with some assistance from all of you. And New York City, uh, hey, there's a lot of people there. There was during the time when Hopper was there, of course. He doesn't really depict um, the overcrowding and um, slums or crime or anything like that. Um, he does include people in his work and stuff, but he takes kind of a uh, selective view of New York City, which is not surprising because New York is such a diverse, complicated, uh, big place. It's hard to hard for any artist to be all encompassing of the different um, scenes of New York City, so to speak. And we were talking about how artists, they're influencing culture and they're recording history, et cetera, et cetera. So when Hopper was born, there was 28% of Americans lived in the city. 
when he died, 74% were living in the city. So you can see the urban percentage of the population explodes during his lifetime. Um, in this era, most people were living on farms uh, or in very rural areas, and then people flocked to the cities. And Hopper um, is kind of witnessing all this and participating um, in this himself. And so you end up you know, with all the people. And so let's look at some of his works. Um, so one thing that you should keep in mind is, God, there's a lot of great art museums out there, particularly in the United States. And you might be surprised if you're traveling somewhere uh, to kind of stumble across a museum that you might not consider all that uh, large, um, has a fabulous art collection. Like, so for instance, this is the Muskegon Museum of Art, which is in Western Michigan. And they have one of Hopper's most famous paintings, New York Restaurant. 1921. So not all the great artworks um, for any artist, whether it's Edward Hopper or George O'Keefe, is that necessarily the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. or the Met or the Art Institute of Chicago or something like that. All right, so here's the one I thought we would um, spend a little bit longer talking about just to kind of see what your thoughts are on this work. And again, here's another example. This is at the Des Moines Art Center in Iowa. Um, a nice museum. It's not one of the world's most famous art museums. Um, but this is probably Hopper's second most famous painting after Nighthawks. It's called The Automat. And it's from 1927. And you can already kind of see some things that we've looked at earlier in terms of like the window view and the women and it's at night, et cetera, et cetera. But let's, I'll go through this a little bit um, and then we'll stop and kind of see what your thoughts are in this painting and see what you see. So here it is. And it's a really intriguing painting. And it's a real paradox because on the one hand, there it's pretty simple composition. It's a woman sitting at a table in a, like a restaurant at night. Um, but if you kind of look at it in a little more detail, there's really kind of a lot going on and a little bit of a mystery as to what's taking place. So let's talk about that. Now, usually uh, throughout history, cafes and bars and stuff like that, that's where people go to meet one another and socialize and things like that. Um, so here's a famous painting. This is called Cafe Seen in Paris from 1877 by a French artist. Um, and you can see the people here and they're reading and smoking and talking and drinking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then here's another one from John Sloan, 1912 McSorley's Bar. Um, and again, same thing. There's these guys standing around, they're drinking and talking and so such. So usually uh, before Hopper, when you think of cafes and restaurants and bars and stuff like that, you kind of think of people coming together and interacting with one another. And then you have his work, <laughs> where it's just this uh, woman sitting by herself. Um, so a little bit very different approach than what's been done before. Hopper was influenced by a number of artists, and one artist in particular was Edouard Manet, the great French Impressionist artist. And he made a painting that's at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. called Plum Brandy. And so that's it over here. And then so here's Hopper. So, definitely not the same painting. It's not like this is uh, a copy or an extrapolation of Manet's work. But that being said, um, you can maybe kind of see some similarities. They're both women. Uh, they're on this marble tabletop. They're by themselves. They look like they're kind of thinking, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's an interesting kind of compare and contrast between uh, Manet and Hopper. And then the, the title of the painting is Automat. And you might not be familiar with that if you're not from New York City. So Automat was kind of sort of like a restaurant uh, back in the day. So let's talk about these. So what happens is you go in here and they have these slots. It's almost like a big giant vending machine, except instead of candy bars and uh, Cokes, they have sandwiches and soups and desserts and stuff like that. So you just essentially go in here, um, look through the glass windows and pick out uh, what you want. Oops, went too far. Um, so like here's a woman, that's what she's doing. So you take the stuff out, um, you peek in the window, look for what you want, you put coins in, um, and then open up the door. So these were really, really popular during the Edward Hopper era, the time he's living in New York City. 
And then again, here's, here's a great way where art is influencing popular culture. So Time Magazine uh, does this story about the 20th century blues, stress, anxiety, depression. The new science of evolutionary psychology finds the roots of modern maladies in our genes. And so, um, you know, it's funny, they could probably reprint this same exact title uh, and change the, the 21st century blues <laughs> and it would still be um, timeless. But notice they're using this Hopper image um, as the artwork on the magazine cover. And okay, so let's talk about some of the aspects of the painting here and kind of see what's going on. One of the challenges with looking at art is you have to look at it from the time it was created and not your modern view. So for instance, what I mean by that, if you were to look at this woman, um, chances are there might not really be anything all that striking about the clothes that she's wearing. However, um, this would have been kind of somewhat racy uh, during Hopper's time because you can see her legs and fashion had really changed a lot uh, during this time. So if you can see here, this is kind of a snapshot of what women's fashions were like in the early and mid 1920s. Um, and you can see for the most part, the legs are covered up. But as time goes by, uh, the hemline goes up and up and you can see more of women's legs. And so uh, that's what's taking place here. In fact, the legs uh, are probably the brightest part of the painting. And so we might not notice that looking at this in modern contemporary times, but for someone in his era, their eyes might have gravitated towards that because it was much, much different back then than it is now. And then also another thing that's interesting is the fact that a painting can sometimes evolve and lead to other stuff. So here's Automat, it's done in 1927, 13 years later, he'd make Nighthawks. And again, definitely not the same painting, but you can kind of see some similarities. You have these figures, uh, they're in these restaurant type settings, it's in a big city, it's nighttime, uh, they're kind of pondering different things. And then also notice some other stuff. So someone pointed out earlier, I don't remember who it was, someone very observant, why is she only wearing one glove? I don't know, good question. <laughs> um, so yeah, she's she still has one of her gloves on and she's taken one of her gloves off and she's probably stopped to have a snack because here's an empty plate. Um, so it looks like she has a cup of coffee and an empty plate and she's taken the one glove off. He purposely, um, I think blackened out the background. Normally I think you would have been able to see outside this window um, to see what was going on, but he didn't want you to focus on what's going on outside. He wanted you to focus on the inside. So that's why he made the window look like that, I think. Here's a close up. And see, so, you know, what is she doing? Um, notice the bowl of colorful fruit here in the background. Um, you know, she's just kind of sitting here. So you kind of wonder, well, what is she doing? Is she just, she's just get off of work? Um, is she going on a job interview? Is she on her lunch break? Maybe, maybe she works nights at a department store or something, and maybe she's on her lunch break. Um, maybe she's meeting someone here on a date. Maybe she went on a date uh, and is now on her way back home or something. Who knows? The possibilities are endless. And so uh, there's some story with that. Here's a little bit more of a close up. Patty and I won't tell you what the other group said about this painting. Um, so we don't sway the direction one way or the other, but um, then there was a documentary that was recently came out called Automat that was put out by Mel Brooks. And a lot of famous New Yorkers um, gave their uh, memories of the Automats like Colin Powell, Howard Schultz, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, now, he actually talked about how the automat kind of somewhat influenced Starbucks being created. And so if you want to check that out, it's called the automat. So anyway, here's our painting. And when you take a look at this, what do you think and see? It's always interesting uh, when you can go to a museum in person with your friends or family or significant other, whatever, and kind of talk about the art. Like, hey, you know, what do you see when you look at this? So we thought we'd do like an online or a virtual um, equivalent of that. So let's kind of open the chat up. Um, Patty and I will kind of uh, uh, MC the discussion from the audience and you can let us know what your thoughts are. Patty, anything, we'll start off with you. Anything pop out at this, that, you know, you're looking at this again 
from way back uh, a few weeks ago. There's a great comment that I've never seen anyone offer before from Mark Wallant. His paintings are all so silent. That's something I've never heard anybody describe a painting as before. I love no, I it. Never, I never have either, but that is a good point. I love it. Uh, the window has been kind of a post. mystery as to what she's doing. Um, the people seem to be really kind of want to figure that out. What exactly is she doing here in this cat? Like, why is she here and all that kind of stuff? What were you going to say, Patty? Sorry. Uh, I just lost the, the thing I, I was about to read. She's looking at her coffee. Nowadays, she'd be staring at her smartphone. That comes <laughs> up every time you do this program. <laughs> Sadness, isolation. She has, has had an argument at home and needed to get out. <laughs> it's a, the, they're sad, contemplative, lonely. Uh, beautiful. Now, see, here's he's waiting that, for the Zoom call to start. Right. Uh, <laughs> contemplating, which that's that's more how I tend to uh, see it. Um, sadness, isolation. Okay, I already read that one. Um, it's hard to uh, contemplating. Uh, somebody else is pointing out the uh, one of the things I think is fabulous about this painting is the reflection of light in the window. It yeah mm -hmm. it draws you into the outside world without showing you anything of the outside world so to me it keeps her from seeming cut off do you know what i mean it's sort of mm -hmm. like the path is there it, it almost is laid out like a yellow brick road almost mm -hmm. so um yeah uh let's see sk uh says she's whoops i've just lost that one um Turn of the century, young woman on a coffee break, sitting by herself, stood up on a date. <laughs> <laughs> they, amazingly, people with just this lone figure, so many people project relationships, sad, contemplative, and lonely. Uh, and we had a big debate on that last time. So there were, um, so the, the pre, one of the previous times we did this, the kind of the direction, the discussion went, went oh, you know, she must be sad because she's by herself and you know, there must be something wrong. But then other people are chiming in, well, no, just because she's by herself and sitting there thinking doesn't mean that, you know, she had a bad experience or is lonely or anything like that. That was a really interesting discussion, that, um, the different kind of the perspectives <laughs> that people were chiming in on. Allison says it's Paddington Bear waiting for tea with the queen. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't... I, and again, I suppose you could say her expression is ambiguous. I don't see it as overwhelmingly downcast. I think it's like, even that is ambiguous. You you could take it in any direction you want, but she's, I love the colors in this too. The colors keep it from feeling um, um, bleak along with those lights. Um, Dr. Sophie Wasson says it's... Uh, so centered, which I agree, it is very centered. She, she's front and center. It's not cut off like some of his things are, uh, or the people isn't. And okay, she's saying the fruit is centered. <laughs> you brought up a good point about the colors because we've seen we've seen that in some of his others work, other works where they are much more melancholy uh, because the buildings are kind of run down or uh, you know various things like that. But you don't really get a sense of that here because of the light. Uh, and the colors of the fruit. Someone asked, like, well, would the automat have that kind of fruit? I'm not really sure. Um, maybe that's just a prop, but there is a lot of kind of bright colors and light in this. And so, you know, maybe it isn't necessarily a, a sad type of scene. I guess, I guess this might be one of those kind of paintings or artworks where, you know what, if you're sad and you look at this, you might, it might mirror that back to you. Or if you're just kind of happy or contemplating something you look at it might kind of get that from it so he really kind of leaves it open to interpretation yeah and if you're somebody that that doesn't um that that feels that need to always be connecting i think you're going to um feel a little bit disconnected and and project that um whereas if you're somebody who is perfectly comfortable um even after all this COVID time being uh, on your own, it, it, it doesn't. Now here, uh, Zoom user says, to me, the lights are not outside. They're a reflection of the size of the restaurant and punctuate her solitude in such a vast dining spot. Yet she doesn't seem sad. She seems at ease in her solitude. I would agree with that entirely, yeah. 
That's what mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, so someone asked, would it have been cold there? Yeah, it probably would have because she's wearing somewhat of a heavier coat. Actually, let me go back to the zoom into the details. So yeah, she's wearing somewhat of a heavier coat. It was it was interesting that I don't remember who it was someone very early on. Why did she take her glove off? Well, she must, I'm guessing, be a little bit cold because she left um, this glove on, or maybe she's not planning on sticking around very long. She just wants to eat her snack and drink her coffee and get going. I think, yeah, gloves are probably were a lot more common in this era too. So you didn't necessarily take them off all the time. Oh yeah, so, you know, that is a good point. Yeah, the fashion has changed. And again, here's the comparison with the night hots, which we'll look at a little bit later. Teresa, Teresa says she sees her trying to make a decision. And <laughs> okay, the comment about it being cold. I even like the radiator. I, I can't. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I always notice that radiator every time I look at this painting as the, it, it belongs there. I mean, it, it for no reason other than, oh yeah, it's part of the scene. Um, somebody, and I lost it, so I'm gonna um, paraphrase, is saying that if she felt lonely, she would not have chosen to sit right in front of the window, which I think is a good point. Mm -hmm. She doesn't feel defensive or alone or, or diminished in any way because she's plumped right in front of that window. Yeah, and what does it mean that, and maybe or maybe there is no meaning, but you know, okay, you can see the door right here. So that kind of gave me, you can use that for something. And then there's, notice there's this empty chair here. So there's probably another table over here. But yeah, if you did kind of want to be by yourself, um, maybe not the spot in the auto mat uh, you would have selected. Um, so, you know, who knows? It, it could yeah, really Sandra, go in a hundred different she directions. Would, if she was shy or private or unhappy, she wouldn't be sitting in front of the window. And mm -hmm. that's a perfectly reasonable way to uh, to look at it. Um, yeah, glove off to be able to hold the ear of the coffee cup, which would be harder with the glove on. I, I, that wasn't oh, yeah. that uncommon in that era to only take off the glove you needed to, you know, use the hand for. Mm -hmm. um, and most gloves would be kind of slippery on a delicate china cup like that. So. Uh -huh. Uh, well, not. another thing to kind of think about, how would this painting be interpreted differently if it was a man? Suppose it was a guy sitting here and he took his glove off and he had a hat on and he was just sitting here, um, you know, looking down at his coffee. How would we interpret that um, differently just because of our, you know, backgrounds and thoughts and experiences and stuff is kind of another uh, way to think about this. And that's a great point to bring up, Robert, because I have a feeling a lot of the comments would be very different. <laughs> yeah, they probably would. It, I'm thinking maybe it wouldn't be quite as, like I think for a lot of, not necessarily, not for myself, but I think for some people, they look at this, oh, this is a sad paint because the woman's, you know, sitting here by herself and she's probably lonely. Not that everyone has it, but I think if, if you had to do like a pie chart, uh, a fair number of people would say that. But I'm wondering if it was a man there instead of a woman, if maybe not as many people would think that, you like, well, it's a guy or so, you know, doing his own thing or whatever. Uh, so now, now here's a question and about when the paint, my sense is that this is pre World War II, but this uh, Joan is asking uh, when it was done because she's thinking of a young widow after the war with the empty chair epitomizing her absent husband. I think oh, yes. I'm going to go so down no, this, my throat now. Yeah, this was done in 1927. So kind of in so between, between the wars. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's before the Great Depression. Um, and, you know, these were kind of booming economic times in the United States, and a lot of uh, women are getting a lot more freedom, not just in terms of their dress, but going out in the working world and you know, kind of doing their own things. So 1927. Yeah, Carol seeing fatigue, which, I, again, I don't pick that up from her expression, but I, admittedly, the, the expression is ambiguous, you know, it, you can put your own story on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also interesting if you look at these two paintings, which I don't think um, Hopper was trying to copy Manet, but notice Manet, the woman really dominates the painting and you can see her face very clearly. And it's kind of a similar thing. We're not quite sure what she's doing. Um, this was a, would have been a little bit scandalous because she's drinking an alcoholic drink here. This is a plum brandy and she's smoking a cigarette out in public, which um, and it looks like she's by herself. So during Manet's time, this would have been a little um, salacious, so to speak. Whereas with Hopper, he, um, you know, the woman kind of is front and center, so to speak, and really our eyes gravitate towards it. But there's also a lot of other things going on in the painting. Or if you kind of compare it to these 
uh, works of, again, kind of all the hustle and bustle and socializing and cafes and bars and restaurants and contrast that with what's going on here. That's well, yeah, and the, the two to the left are, are both very much pastel and the, the uh, hopper is very vivid color. And to me, the pastels almost make the people themselves kind of like interchangeable, especially because there's more of them in the scene. Whereas this lady, I mean, he wants us to see this lady. Oh yeah, I mean, your eyes kind of just naturally go right towards her. And he is, she is centered right in the frame. I mean, he does do the cropping that you spoke of, but the person isn't cropped in any way. Mm -hmm. It's like he centers her right in that window. I just, I, I absolutely adore this. I like copper anyway, but I absolutely adore this painting. Oh yeah, it's just really fascinating. You can look at it for a long time. So, all right, well, that was awesome. Uh, again, so bad, you know, I was gonna kick because these directions always kind of tend to go in a different direction depending on um, who's on the call at any given time. So thank you much for that. We'll do, uh, we'll do this again. Just to finish up, time. Norma says, the ideal of the modern working woman. <laughs> we'll finish on an optimistic note. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean this. So you might not have seen uh, this type of setting, say, um, fifteen years earlier. A well-dressed woman out by herself at night. Um, that would have been kind of unusual. But things had really changed a lot um, by the time it got to night. It was not uncommon to see women out by themselves at night. Um, in places like this. There was a time in Europe and America where you saw a woman at, by herself at night, well, she must be a prostitute or something. Um, but things had changed a lot and women are getting a lot more independence um, than they had just say a decade or 15 years earlier. Yes, and somebody did make that point that in the, uh, the French paintings that the implication was that those were working girls, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I don't get that impression at all that this lady is open for business that isn't what no I no no I, yeah I don't I don't and I haven't really heard many other people ever if anybody say that in the different times you've done this program so okay so all right well that was awesome uh let's continue I will do that again with a later painting but uh let's get back to the artwork so this is Toledo Museum of Art two on the aisle from 1927 one of the things about Hopper's works is you can kind of it's almost hard to describe, Like you can kind of see a painting like, oh yeah, that must be one of his, like, cause these kind of all are a little bit similar, but yet the, the um, subject and things like that are very diverse. So here's Chop Suey. This is another one of his famous paintings. This is from 1929. So a couple of years after the auto bad. And this one um, has quite a few similarities and differences with the one that we just spent some time looking at. So chop suey, um, you used to hear that term a lot, but you don't so much um, anymore. Uh, and so Chinese cuisine was becoming much more popular in the United States at this point. Now, this is another painting where you probably wouldn't have had a chop suey sign uh, in the painting 20 years earlier because the cuisine uh, was not that well known. And this, um, people think that Hopper, uh, is depicting a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant that he actually liked to visit uh, in Greenwich Village that wasn't far from his house, or I mean his studio. And so you can see quite a few similarities and differences. There's you know figures and they're in a restaurant and he's kind of hinting at some of the story but not telling us the whole story. And then you compare that to Nighthawks. Some, again, to kind of look at this through the historical perspective, some people that are fashion experts have commented like, wow, these women are really uh, modern dressed. Uh, this is a sweater advertisement from the same year this painting was made. And you can see how different their styles are uh, versus the style of women, you know, kind of a um, very tight sweater, so to speak. And then also the lipstick. Um, is paramount. And women had actually just really been wearing this bright colored lipstick for about mm, maybe 15 years or so. Um, it's kind of become more mainstream.
And then in the background, there's this couple, and we're not quite sure what they're doing. It look, he looks like he's looking at his phone, uh, but of course, this was before the smartphones were invented. And then you have these two women, and so um, again, kind of what are these two women doing? Are they friends? Uh, are they coworkers? Is it a job interview? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. <laughs> um, we this was a painting we kind of rotate the paintings we discuss, but we had discussed this one in an earlier program and it got a lot of uh, interesting responses like, oh, I'm so over hearing her drama while I'm trying to eat lunch and stuff like that. Um, notice they're on the table is empty for the most part, they haven't gotten their food. So, and then back to them. And so again, kind of that thought of, you know, what, what are these people doing exactly? Well, we don't know. They're there, but we're not quite sure what their story is. And someone asked earlier, what are Hopper's paintings worth? Uh, this is the one that sold for the most amount of money. It was a few years ago, it sold for $91.9 million. So there you have it. This is called Tables for Ladies. Here's another one where he's kind of taken a journalistic approach. You might be wondering, Tables for Ladies? What is that? And it's from 1930. And again, there was a time when women didn't really go out by themselves. And so advertisements from this era would oftentimes advertise tables for ladies, meaning that women could come here and sit uh, by themselves and not have to worry about, you know, not being allowed in the restaurant or not being accepted because they didn't have a, a chaperone, so to speak. Um, and so he's hinting at that with his title. It's the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And so this is 1930, the year after the Great Depression started. And you kind of wonder if maybe he's hinting at that a little bit. There were a lot of people that had lost their jobs and their homes and uh, finances were tough. It looks like it's cold out um, because you can see the woman's coat here is hanging up and so who knows there probably could have been a lot of people that would have been just walking down the street that were uh, tired and hungry and without a home and they come uh, look into this restaurant and they can see it's warm inside there's the plants and the bright fruits and the foods and the you know, the steaks and the champagne and stuff like that uh, might have been a very appealing sight to someone in 1930. Here's room in New York City from 1932. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the majority of the paintings that are kind of the window scenes, which I guess you could probably categorize this as, um, have solitary female figures in them, but not all of them. Uh, this is one example that has a man and a woman. Again, kind of what are they doing? Uh, they're, they're in this room, but they don't seem to be paying any attention to one another at all. He's reading, it looks like the newspaper and she's kind of playing around with the piano. And then kind of what other types of artwork is being made around this time? Well, this is during the era of the Great Depression. And so a lot of artists, uh, regardless of their style, are focused on aspects of that. So here's the great photographer, Margaret Bork White. And this is one of her most well-known photos uh, for 1937. This is called World's Highest Standard of Living, the American Way. And this is after a national disaster. There's a group of people out here. Uh, that are waiting in line for government assistance. And so it's one of the most famous photos of the 20th century. And then here's another one, Migrant Mother, 1936. So you've perhaps seen these paintings before. Um, so these artists, these two photographers, they're documenting the Great Depression that's taking place at this point in time. Um, and Hopper doesn't really do that directly. Um, he kind of does it maybe a little bit indirectly. A lot of people during the 1930s um, sought escape from the Great Depression by going to the movies. You have kind of this convergence of um, people wanting to escape their reality of their situation uh, by going to the movies, while at the same time you have a lot of technological advances in movie theaters, which made them much more popular than they had been just a decade earlier. So this is called New York Movie from 1939 also one of his most well-known works. And you have this young woman here leaning up against the wall. And then you have a couple figures here watching the movie. It's almost kind of like two paintings in one. Um, you have the film theater over here on the left. And then 
walkway on the right. This was the golden era of Hollywood and movies and uh, again, kind of the convergence of the Great Depression uh, and people wanting some way to escape uh, along with the technological advances in the film industry. So movies became very, very popular. This was something not as common 10 years earlier. And Hopper himself was a big movie buff. That was one of the main things that he liked to do in his free time was watch movies. And you'd have these pa movie palaces that people would go to with uh, velvet curtains and you know, all that kind of stuff, gold leaf and these architectural details. And what the films were coming out at this point in time? Well, back in 1939, the year this painting was made, two of the big classics were The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. And so here's our film usher and a photograph. So where the uniforms. And so unlike the photographs we saw a minute ago that were capturing the Great Depression, he's kind of depicting the fact that movies are very popular at this point in time in history, which is somewhat of a byproduct of the Depression, but he's not actually showing the Great Depression directly. And those are his scenes of New York City life. All right, here's Nighthawks. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about Nighthawks because it's such a well-known painting um, already. Um, but I thought we did, should cover it a little bit. Here's a great quote from Edward Hopper. If you could say it in words, there would be no reason to paint. Uh, Nighthawks, it's not our super big, giant, enormous painting, but here it is on display. It's in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago, one of the world's great art museums. And you have these four figures and they're in this restaurant. And it was done in 1942. So the early part of World War II in America. But again, you don't get a sense of World War II um, in looking at the painting. Edward Hopper said that Nighthawks was inspired by a restaurant on New York's Greenwich Avenue, where two streets meet. Um, but the image, with its carefully constructed composition and lack of narrative, has a timeless universal quality that transcends its particular locale. One of the best known images of the 20th century art, the painting depicts an all-night diner in which three customers, all lost in their own thoughts, have congregated. Hopper's understanding of the expressive possibilities of light playing on simplified shapes gives the painting its beauty. Fluorescent lights had just come into use in the early 1940s. So interesting that he's capturing that. And the all-night diner emits an eerie glow, like a beacon on the dark street corner. The four anonymous and uncommutative night owls seem as separate and remote from the viewer as they are from one another. The red-haired woman was actually modeled by the artist's wife, Jo. So here's the painting. It's iconic, one of the most uh, famous images in American art. It gets spoofed often in different kind of uh, pop culture parodies. People have often wondered what the inspiration was for Nighthawks. There was a popular short story by Ernest Hemingway called The Killers, which came out in 1927. They later made a film about it, um, but it's kind of set in like one of these all night diners. And Hopper had read that story. Um, and so some people maybe think that when it got some inspiration from that, there was also a Vincent Van Gogh exhibit in New York um, shortly before the painting was made. And Van Gogh did night cafe scenes. And again, not exactly anywhere near what Hopper did, but who knows, maybe he might have got some inspiration from that as well. It's a close up of the figures. You could easily spend a whole hour or more talking about the Nighthawks, but again, kind of, um, I was really hoping to kind of spend more of this program kind of looking at other artwork by Edward Hopper just because Nighthawks is already so, so well known to so many people. So just kind of wanted to cover um, some of the basics of it and then kind of continue on. It's the kind of painting where everyone recognizes it or at least most people, but they really kind of studied the details uh, like the salt <laughs> shaker and the napkin holder <laughs> and you know, the coffee mug and stuff like that. So a lot of interesting details. Here's the couple.
And you contrast that with, say, a feel-good painting uh, like the work that Norman Rockwell was doing. So this is another famous uh, artistic image from this era, Freedom from Want, from 1943. And, you know, it's not the same thing. It's not a restaurant. It looks like we're over at Grandma's and Grandpa's house um, having Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner with the turkey. And there's all the people interacting with one another. And you kind of contrast it with looks like this. So <laughs> a very different approach with the Nighthawks. All right, let's continue on. Uh, Hopper was really fascinated by the sea and a lot of his paintings um, have to do with either seascapes or Cape Cod. Here's some examples. Here's a picture of Hopper as a young boy, with a rowboat. Sailing from 1911. Lighthouse Hill at the Dallas Museum of Art for our friends that are in Texas. Hill and Houses, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, 1927. You see a lot, remember before we were talking about architecture. Uh, and so a lot of these depictions of the coastline have Cape Cod type homes or lighthouses and things like that, including random telephone pole. <laughs> so these paintings are very, very different than the works that we were kind of focusing on earlier, the window scenes, and the woman and the auto mad, and stuff like that, the night hawks. So you can actually um, sometimes visit Hopper's studio. He actually purchased a home in Cape Cod. In, in the 1930s, he starts going there with his wife to vacation and work. And then eventually he ends up purchasing a home. The home is not typically open to the public, um, although periodically it is. Um, one of the noteworthy features, look at this massive window that he had. Uh, this is the other side of the house. So the window, this is the home and studio. This was his like summer vacation home slash studio. Uh, the window is on the opposite side. Um, but look at the size of that. And then here's his wife, Joe, in the background. And so that's one reason why he ends up doing a lot of works in this area, because he was spending a lot of time here in the summers beginning of the 1930s. Prior to that, he had vacationed frequently in Maine. Um, so he does a number of paintings that area as well. This is really beautiful with the blue colors and the sailboat and the White House in the background. And then during this time, the winds of war are blowing in the 1930s. And so um, I'm showing you these images because if you look at, go back and look at media, of the day, whether it's newspapers or magazines or stuff like that. The war in Europe and Asia is really dominating the news uh, at this point in time. I mean, you don't really get a complete sense of that by looking at Hopper's work. He maybe kind of hints at it, kind of like how he did uh, with the Great Depression. So some people kind of maybe see uh, Concerns about war in these two paintings, the one on the left is called Cape Cod Evening, the one on the right is called Groundswell. These are both done in 1939, so two years before the United States entered World War II, and these are both at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. So some people analyze this painting and come up with a thought like, well, you have this couple here and uh, it's a summer evening and you know, you're just kind of enjoying it. But look at the dog. Something has gotten its attention off in the distance. It's alert to something. And, you know, maybe these people kind of represent the United States uh, at this point in time, hadn't been involved in the war. Uh, but maybe the dog is looking out towards the trouble that's lurking off in the distance. And then here's Hopper's depiction of this or description of this painting. It's no transcription of a place, but pieced together from sketches and mental impressions of the things in the city. Oftentimes the structures in Hopper's works aren't exact depictions of things. They're oftentimes uh, kind of composites of different things that he had or different memories.
this is a really beautiful painting when you see it in person, uh, much more so than the image here on the screen. This is Groundswell from 1939. And again, some people have looked at this and kind of wondered if he's um, giving kind of some sense of the things in store for the United States. So you have these figures here and they're relaxing and enjoying themselves on a warm day on a boat, but notice the sea is really getting choppy. Uh, these big waves, uh, this is tilted over to the side. Um, so maybe this idyllic scene that they're enjoying uh, is about to change for the worse as the waves all of a sudden um, seem to be really picking up. And notice they're all looking off in the same direction. So what are they looking at? Are they looking at something in the uh, distance that's a cause for concern? We don't know. So seascapes in Cape Cod. All right, let's talk about travel and travelers. Here's some works from this subject. And after World War II, there was a travel boom in the United States. Um, people were happy that the war was over. There was a lot more disposable income. The economy was booming. They were building uh, the interstate highway system. So you have a lot of people traveling. See advertisements for that, look in magazines and newspapers and things of this era, the golden age of the road trip. And you have George O'Keefe, another uh, contemporary of Hopper, what she working at this point in time while well, she's doing her famous flower paintings. And then also New Mexico. So uh, O'Keefe had left New York City um, and started spending a significant amount of time in New Mexico. And she ends up incorporating those scenes into her artwork. And here is Joe in Wyoming from 1946. So this is Hopper and his wife. They went on a road trip and you can see his wife, Joe, who was an artist. Um, she is making an artwork in the passenger seat. Here's a woman traveling by train. This is before World War II, but still kind of a travel theme. So Hopper liked to travel, as did his wife. So they went and visited a number of places during their marriage. Uh, history painting is a popular genre, not so much now, um, but throughout much of history. And Hopper really only did two history type paintings. And for whatever reason, um, he did them both while he was at, on the Gettysburg battlefield. So Hopper, uh, liked history, liked historical subjects. He visited Gettysburg, was intrigued by that. He didn't do a battle scene, um, but he did do this scene of the troops here, dawn before Gettysburg, 1938. Again, just want to show you some images of different types of work uh, that the artist did. So you don't just think that he's doing these lonely, solitary figures in cafes and stuff and diners. And then this is called Light Battery at Gettysburg, 1940. Um, some people have theorized maybe these military um, themes were an interest because, again, the war uh, brewing overseas and is the United States going to get dragged into this? Because notice both paintings are before the battle. So dawn before Gettysburg from 1938. And Light Battery. Notice this is not a battle scene, per se. The troops are going off to fight. Um, so maybe some parallels there, perhaps. Hotel lobby. It's a cathedral in Mexico. If you like Mexico, Hopper did a whole series of works of Mexico when he took a trip down there. Let me have time to show you this one. Here's another road trip. You can tell this is the American Southwest by the adobe style of the buildings and the background. Here's the Ford dealership sign, the blue oval. Portrait of Orleans, 1950, with the SO sign. So notice we've seen a lot of signs. We saw XLAX, Ford Motor Company, 
company. Um, let's see, what was the other one? Oh, Texaco, uh, or no, not Texaco, Mobile Oil, Chop Suey, et cetera, et cetera. So you see a lot of advertisements or like brand images uh, appearing in his artwork. South Carolina Morning, 1956. Western Motel, 1957. Again, this is another interesting thing. Like, what is this woman doing? Her, there's a suitcase in the left corner. There's a car outside. Is she just arriving at the uh, place or is she getting ready to leave? Is she waiting for somebody? We don't know. So you see travel and travelers in a lot of Hopper's works. Let's talk about Hopper's wife, Jo. There she is on the right. They were born just a few months apart and they ended up actually passing away just a few months, one other. Um, Edward Hopper passed away first. Uh, and then a few months later, his wife, Joe or Josephine, she passed away. They were married in 1924 and they were together for 43 years until he died. Some portraits of them. That's a self-portrait from 1945. And then a portrait of her from around the same era. I like this work a lot. Uh, it's not one of his most well-known ones, but he must have came upon his wife sketching at the beach or on the beach. And so he did this nice depiction of her. I really like the colors in this one. And Jo was a talented artist in her own right. She really put her career uh, on the back burner, so to speak, and to focus on her husband's work. Um, Hopper liked to make paintings and do artistic. He didn't like all the business side of the art world. So his wife, Jo, really kind of functioned as his manager. Um, making appointments for him and talking to art dealers and arranging his schedule and uh, all that kind of stuff. So you don't hear much about her artwork, um, even though she was very talented because she really ends up sacrificing her career um, for her husband's, which was not all that uncommon, particularly back then. Uh, this is probably the most famous depiction of her done by her husband in 1936, Joe painting. But if you wanna learn more about her artwork, uh, just Google Josephine Hopper, and you can see more examples of that. All right, I didn't know what to call this section, so I decided to label it love or not. So are these people in love or aren't they? Let's take a look and see. And this is the painting we're gonna spend a little bit extra time on, like we did for the Automat, FYI. So here's a <laughs> depiction from when Hopper was on one of his trips to Paris. And at the time he was single. I don't know if he had really a lot of success dating Hopper. I've never really seen much um, information about kind of his romantic life before he met Joe. So who knows, maybe perhaps um, he was kind of intrigued, you know, Paris is the city of lovers. Um, and he had this young couple here embracing. So who knows, maybe Hopper was, uh, intrigued by this because someone brought it up earlier and it's a pretty well-known fact. You don't really see a lot of uh, romantic type stuff in his paintings per se. Um, but interestingly enough, you do in this one, uh, which is very early in his career from 1920. So a very different type of uh, depiction than you see in the other couples are much more kind of isolated um, than they are. So interesting to see this. And then you got the, got the waiter over here. He's, he's seen it all before. <laughs> And then these two guys kind of just going about their business. Uh, here's another famous work from this era, Grant Wood's iconic American Gothic from 1930. This actually is not a romantic couple. Um, it's a woman and her father, but some people kind of depict it as, or think about it in terms of like a married couple. And so here's this painting. Let's talk about this one. And we had a really interesting, 
and lively discussion last time uh, on this one. So let's see what this one's all about. So I'll do the same thing. I'll kind of describe this, give you a little bit of an overview, uh, and then you can let us know what your thoughts are. This is, so this is called Office at Night. Um, after the Night Hawks and the Automat, this is probably uh, one of Hopper's most well-known works. Like if you had to list like, I don't know, the top five, this would be out here. It's at the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, and it was done in 1940, so the year before the U.S. entered World War II. Not that that really seems to matter all that much. Um, so you have this woman here, and she's standing at this filing cabinet, and it's kind of like one of the window scenes we saw earlier. Um, and there's a guy, and he's at a desk, and he's looking at a paper, um, and there's kind of some stuff laying around, like a typewriter and some papers and things. Um, now, one of the things that's really intriguing about art is sometimes an artist will just start painting on the canvas and they just do it all in one shot. Uh, some other times, though, they'll do drawings and sketches and things like that. And so that's actually what Hopper would do oftentimes. And he did that in this particular case. And it's noteworthy because you can kind of see how things change or evolve. So this was the first drawing that he did in preparation for the painting. And then here's the second one, and then the third one, and then the finished painting. And so you can kind of look at this and see like, well, what's different from all these? Notice in this one, the guy is a little bit older. It might be kind of hard to tell, but the guy is a little bit older than he is in the finished painting. He's also um, turned sideways. And then also quite a few people pointed out her clothing and position has changed. Um, here, she's just kind of looking straight ahead. Um, over here though, she's looking towards the man. Um, people usually point out the fact that her dress is a little bit tighter <laughs> than it was before um, and things like that. So again, interesting kind of watch things evolve. So here's the second work and here's the fourth one. And so again, notice the woman her position and her clothing is very different than the woman over here. And then same thing for the man. He was initially much older um, and he was looking, facing her, even though he was looking down and now he's quite a bit younger. So I kind of leery about maybe showing you these images because you might um, start developing a narrative based on what this looked like. Um, which may or may not be accurate. Uh, notice too, there's also a piece of paper on the floor here, uh, et cetera, it's, you know, the typewriter, and you got the chair here, there's a piece of paper here, it's not over here. There's a painting on the wall here, and there isn't over here. So a lot of interesting details here. And then before we were talking about these different subjects or themes of Hopper's work, window scenes, architecture, New York City life, seascapes and Cape Cod, travel and travelers, love or not, uh, nudes, he oftentimes using more than one. So this is a great example. It's really kind of like a window scene type painting. Um, it's set in New York City. And then, you know, is there something going on with these two people, so to speak, or not? So let's take a look at that. Here's the full view of the painting. And then here's a close up. And then here he is. You can tell it's nighttime, um, or at least it's after dark because he's got the light on, and then the window is very dark. And then here's his little phone and some papers, you know. And so, what is he doing? And then, what is she doing? And so here's some papers here. So when you look at this painting, what do you see? So um, let's get some comments from folks, but um, I'll, in a little bit, I'll share what some of the previous groups have said, um, if no one hints on it. I don't wanna do that now because I don't wanna, the conversation to go in a certain direction. We really had a lively discussion on this uh, last time. So Patty, what do, you, what do you think about this one? And anyone well, in the audience? Kiko. Anybody? Kiko Kennedy ha has made a point that I don't remember anyone making before. She says, only Hopper could make fluorescent lighting beautiful. <laughs> wow, I haven't heard that before. Yeah, no, I haven't heard that one either. So I wanted to make sure I remembered that one. And then, of course, we've got somebody saying, uh, seeing a madman scenario where the man's secretary is both his assistant and his sexual interest. She clearly is more invested in the relationship than he is. <laughs> 
and she's completely, uh, Norma says she's completely focused on the man. Uh, yeah, I, I found uh, some, someone saying also the painting takes a different perspective. I think she's referring back to um, <clears throat> the uh, sketches, but um, yeah, the, the uh, final painting strikes me as being much starker than any of the, um, the uh, drafts he did or the experiments he did. Uh, let's see. I opened up the Zoom chat for everyone. So if you want others to see your questions or comments, you just have to change the to, T-O, to everyone. It's defaulted to hosts and panelists, which is Patty and myself. So if you, if you want others to see your questions and comments, just do that. And we don't want to just um, keep typing away. So this one is interesting was um, because a lot of people look at this like, you know, is there some, like I said, is there something going on with these two? Maybe it's just strictly a professional relationship. Who knows? Um, or maybe there is something, you know, is she interested in him or is he interested in her? Are they interested in each other? Or is there no interest or there was an interest? Or, you know, who really knows? Yeah, Norma's um, saying the tight clothing suggests a sexual tension. Now, I don't, I mean, I may be dense, but I don't quite get this one. Somebody is a Vicky that says she's retrieving the Penske file. <laughs> I, I don't know if that means something, but I just thought it was funny. Um, she's wishing she could go home. <laughs> that one shows up, I think, every time we do this. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, this is an interesting one we were talking before about the gender role. So what if the roles were reversed? What if the woman was sitting at the desk um, and the man, because I think a lot of not everyone, but a lot of people look at this painting and just assume, oh, he must be the boss and she must be the um, employee. But, you know, not necessarily. Who knows? Maybe she's the boss and came in to see what the heck he's doing. Hey, did, hey Bill, did you finish that report yet? <laughs> yeah, what date was this painting done? <laughs> oh, here, I'll I have a feeling it's not probably that. 1940. Yeah, I, but not I, as many yeah. women uh, <laughs> managers. But you know, they do have kind of like a timeless quality. If you're looking at it, I mean, you can look through it in a 19 or a 2022 lens if you want. Well, interestingly, Tracy says she doesn't see any relationship between the two at all. I think myself, I feel like I would have to work at that, <laughs> not mm -hmm. seeing a relationship. Um, mm -hmm. This, for the first time ever, I happen to focus. On one of the sketches, um, it looked like she would, and there, it was, there was more warmth than that one. Uh, yeah, the upper left, it looks like they're almost facing each other, but it almost, oh no, wait, upper right, they're facing each other. And it almost looks like she's opening a safe rather than the file cabinet. So that made me look at the file cabinet and look at how deeply her arm is in that file cabinet. And I suddenly thought, oh, I wonder if she has a gun in there. <laughs> I had never thought of it, but that is kind of an odd length. I mean, you don't, if you're looking for a file, you wouldn't normally be standing like that or having your arm thrust that far into the drawer. You'd be pulling the drawer out. Uh huh. So, yeah. And then, and then we'll look at, look at the other D. Like, why is the typewriter more prominently displayed here uh, than it is over here? And then there's the papers, and then there's a paper on the floor. Um, and there's one on the chair. Notice there's no floor uh, paper or chair paper over here. And then, you know, he got rid of the painting. We were talking earlier um, about the fact that usually when artists do a composition over time, usually it gets more simplified. Um, so maybe not surprising that he got rid of the painting, but um, the wall is, you know, just a stark white. And then even look at the window is a little bit different um, in terms of the way it was before. And then, you know, why, did, why was the guy initially older and looking towards her, and then he tried to change it, make the guy younger and looking straight ahead. I don't know. Vicky says it's a Seinfeld reference. <laughs> 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 Maybe Seinfeld ripped this painting off to come up with that whole series. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Maybe that's where he got his inspiration from. We'll have to check in with Jerry and see what his thoughts are. Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, again, I don't know what the story is, but the final version very definitely suggests some kind of attention to me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, attention within the scene. Yeah, when we were when we did this um, program before, there was just a lot of references on the like the romantic aspects or potential, or like oh she must be interested in him, or you know he's married and they're working late. 
you know, he's trying to figure out what he's going to tell his wife or something. I don't know. Uh, it kind of really went that um, whole direction. But, um, yeah. you know, who knows? There might not be anything like that at all. And that's kind of the beauty of Hopper. He doesn't, he gives you hints, but he doesn't tell you the whole story. It's really up to you. Well, that um, yeah, to me, it's the papers. It is it is featuring the typewriter there and the papers strewn around and there's a bunch of papers on the desk. But this comes up almost every time too. She's the woman alone in the diner. Now you know where she was. Hopper is painting the, the prequel here. <laughs> that has come <laughs> up in, in other programs, I think, that, that there's an implication there. Yeah, the other painting, she just got off work and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and who knows? But um, this is also interesting because to me, your eye kind of darts around and looks at different things where in the woman in the uh, auto mat, you kind of really tend to zoom in on her. And so at least for me, my eye doesn't necessarily focus as quickly on one particular thing. It kind of bounces around looking at the different, like the woman and the guy and kind of the other uh, aspects much more so than the other painting. Okay, Vicki is explaining that the Penske file is the Seinfeld. You can tell I'm not a TV person. <laughs> The Penske file is apparently a Seinfeld reference. Okay, sorry, Vicki, I did not understand that. Oh, no, all good. Mm. Okay, well, let's, conti let's continue on because we're running a little bit. Um, We've started a debate on whether or not she's reaching too far into the file cabinet, but I think that's <laughs> for another, and we can sleep on that one, I think. Uh, this is oh, so yeah. much fun, thank you. Oh yeah, no, no, thank you. So let's continue on. Got a few more things to go over, then we'll um, wrap it up. So, um, so you kind of contrast the interaction of these two figures, which you know we don't know if there's something going on with the doing that with this one, Norman Rockwell's after the prom from 1957. Um, you can obviously see the attraction between the uh, young woman and the young man. So again, uh, Hopper taking a very different approach. Here's another one that I was almost tempted to have us discuss this one. This is Summer Evening from 1947. And here's a young couple. Actually, let me go back. So you contrast this one, which young couple, and you can obviously see the um, admiration between the two of them with this one. Um, so what's going on with these two? You have this couple and they're um, on this porch and it's at night and the, the guy is facing the woman. Um, but she doesn't really seem all that interested <laughs> in him. Uh, she's looking straight ahead. Uh, fashion experts have pointed out the fact that while she's really kind of wearing a racy outfit um, for 1947, that would have been pretty risque. What does that mean? Uh, where he's wearing just kind of the traditional pants and shirt. So who knows? It's up for you to interpret. But again, this name of this painting is called Summer Evening from 1947. And you can see, again, a very different approach than the one Rockwell took. And remember, you compare this one to the um, couple in Paris uh, that was kissing <laughs> outdoors in the cafe, uh, and how this one is very, very different. Here's first row orchestra from 1951. We're running a little bit behind on time, so let me go through these kind of quickly. This is Sunlight in the Cafeteria from 1958. So is it love or not? So again, kind of this, oops, um, this contrast between this couple, which you don't really see these types of interactions in Hopper's later works um, with these other people. So are these depictions of love or not? All right, let's look briefly at some nudes that Hopper did. He did quite a few um, nudes during his career, not a lot, but a fair number. Um, apparently he was kind of, he came from a very like conservative household and he was kind of shocked uh, to go to art school and actually see uh, nude figures, both male and female. That wasn't something he was familiar with, but then again, that wouldn't have been a common for people um, of this era. He did some male nudes. Mostly those were early in his career as studies. Um, so this is a time that he's a student and fortunately these works survive. And artists will do depictions of the nude so that they can um, get a good understanding of human anatomy and how the body works and all that kind of stuff. Here, 
female nude. Now, usually, well, not usually, oftentimes in art, um, the nude will have some kind of like sensual um, aspect to it. So this is a famous painting called Roa from 1878. But you don't really get a sense of that Hopper's nude. So just kind of very matter of fact. Um, so this is Morning in a City from 1944. It's not really kind of um, implying any kind of sensuality or anything. Uh, so you can contrast that with this earlier work by a different artists. You have the woman here and she's all sprawled out in the bed and she's nude and it's probably the morning after some romantic um, event because you can see her clothes <laughs> laying here on the ground and you know, the guy's gotten up and uh, et cetera, et cetera. When you contrast that with something like this, well, I don't know, does this have any kind of sensual aspect to it all? It's just a woman um, and she's looking out the window. So I don't know open to interpretation. It's kind of a strange um, place for the bed, kind of tucked off here in the corner. This is called Girly Show from 1941. Diana says, his nudes look like mannequins. This is High Noon from 1949. And this is probably the most famous nude that he did. This is called A Woman in the Sun from 1961. Uh, woman, again, a very sparsely uh, decorated living space, not unlike the studio that we saw. We just see her shoes here. Remember before with Rivera, Diego Rivera, we were talking about the role that like feet and shoes play in his um, depiction. So a little bit different approach here with Hopper. And then let's talk about his later years. Uh, so Hopper was a well-known artist later in life. This was a portrait of him done in 1956, which was used for the cover of Time Magazine. This is People in the Sun from 1960. And this is really his last kind of significant painting. He was starting to, um, he was getting older and his health was deteriorating. Um, so this is two comedians from 1965. Uh, noticed he passed away in 1967. And some people really thought that this was kind of like his swan song uh, here, like his goodbye painting. Um, so what he has here is these are two comedians that are out on the stage, a man and a woman. Uh, notice these two are interacting with one another, which is a little bit different for most of the men and women in Hopper's paintings. And they're coming out on stage and they're kind of saying their goodbye. And so some people, and the uh, male figure is much taller than the female figure. That's the way it was in real life with Hopper and his wife. Um, so some people have really kind of theorized because the age that he was when he made this, the fact that it was one of his last paintings, the fact that um, the subject matter and his health was deteriorating. Is this really kind of like his way of saying, okay, um, you know, I've had a great run and we're doing the curtain call, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Hopper passed away in 1967, his wife, Joe, the following year. They're both buried at a cemetery alongside the Hudson River. Not a very elaborate uh, gravestone by any means. And remember we kicked off our program talking about the American experience how artists have been documenting and recording American history. Uh, while at the same time, artists are influencing and changing American popular culture. And you really get a sense of that with Hopper's work, which is why I called it Edward Hopper and the American Experience. If you wanna see Hopper's works and learn more about him in person, probably the best three places to go to are all in the New York City area. So there's the Edward Hopper House Museum where he was born and raised. There's the Edward Hopper Studio in Greenwich Village. I put a star here because it's not currently open because of COVID, but I'm sure that'll change sooner or later. And then the Whitney Museum in New York has the world's largest collection of Edward Hopper's works. Um, if you wanna learn more about the Whitney Museum, we actually have a program coming up uh, next month that's kind of like this, except instead of just talking about Hopper, it talks about all the modern American artists that are at the Whitney Museum. You can check the calendar for that. And then as far as these programs go, where we feature a certain artist, um, the last time we did Mary Cassatt, and so I'll send out the recording for that if you want to listen to the fascinating life and career of Mary Cassatt, 
Uh, and then there's also this one that we're recording. And then the next one is probably going to be Winslow Homer and the American Experience. I really like American art a lot. And I was trying to decide between Georgia O'Keeffe, Frederick Remington, Winslow Homer, and <laughs> various other ones. And I settled on Winslow Homer. So he'll be the next uh, artist we'll feature in this type of program. I don't have the date for this because I'm still putting the finishing touches in the program, but you can be on the lookout for that. We're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. If you ever made a contribution to support the work we do, thank you. Your donations have kept our programs free. Uh, since 2015, we've been uh, organizing both. Well, in 2015, we were just doing in-person stuff in Washington, D.C. Uh, but since 2015, we've been offering these kind of historical and cultural programs. And along the way, uh, different people have made contributions. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. And Edward Hopper, the painter of Nighthawks. But of course, he also did a lot more interesting things besides that. He was an American realist, and here are some of the work. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. Patty, especially want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to spend some time with us and help uh, narrate, the, narrate the discussion and look at all these different insights. We really get a kick out of viewing these artworks with people. Maybe someday we'll meet in person um, at one of these museums and go check things out. But until then, I want to wish everyone a very excellent, outstanding, great rest of your weekend. Have a blessed day. And remember, July 22nd was Edward Hopper's 140th birthday. So you can have some cake at some point in time in the future. So thanks, everyone. That's the end of our program. Have a great rest of your weekend. Have a great week next week. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.